right now and welcome everybody back um, for our second session. I want to remind you of a couple things. If everyone would please mute um, so that we eliminate any background noise and that if you have any questions at any time or need technical help, um, put your questions in the chat for technical help. Um, you will um, chat directly with Monica, uh, Marsha to address anything of concern. And um, speaking of Marsha, she is our moderator for today's session, but I have the honor of introducing our speaker, Justin Ferrate, and I think we are in for a really big treat here. Um, the title of his presentation is, This is Not the Borscht Belt. So to be clear, um, we together will discover long lost memories of early Jewish resorts of New York's Catskill Mountains. And we are in very good hands because um, Justin um, was um, selected as one of New York's 50 essential secrets among other accolades. He was honored as New York's most engaging tour guide. And get this, he wrote the official New York City professional tour guide licensing exam. So we are in the hands of a professional who um, is going to not take us to the Borscht Belt. So um, we'll give Justin a moment to put up his slides and get started. And, and just uh, one word, as Justin's bringing up his slides, um, we will try to answer questions, but we, if we're not able to, um, we'll, we'll do what we can. But if you do have a question, put it in the chat box. Okay, can everyone see the image? We can see you, but you need to uh, share your screen. Okay, we have to do that again. Okay, just one sec, I apologize. Okay, down at the bottom. No worries. Okay, here we go, sharing screen once again. Back again. And hopefully that's voila. Excellent. Perfect. Everyone see it? Yes. Okay. So greeting from the Catskill Mountains. Uh, thank you very much for that lovely introduction, Naomi. And thank you and Richard for that wonderful talk. That's really great. Before we begin, I do want to say thank you to all of those people across the country who have signed up for this talk. It does my heart good, what can I say? Um, basic information in advance. The material will be text heavy. I know every computer seems to have its own sound system, some of which work well and some not so well. So I have intentionally written words on the screen. You may choose to read them or you may choose to ignore them because I will say basically everything on the screen. But I just wanted to make sure if anyone has trouble hearing that they can understand what the talk is about. Um, we're going to be visiting um, the, just to clarify the story first before up front and lay the cards on the table and Naomi did that very well. There were only three towns in the Cats, I should restate that, three villages in the Catskill Mountains and one hamlet that allowed Jews. Outside of that, until 1964, Jews were not allowed in the Catskills. Now, of course, of course, that's not to say no Jews ever got in, but the basic rule was if you were Jewish and someone knew it, a hotel would refuse you service. If you went to a dining room and they knew you were Jewish, they would say, I'm sorry, we don't serve you. And that would change only in 1964 with the Civil Rights Act. So now that you have that set, and, and I don't know, some of you are saying, well, 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 what about all those other places? We'll talk about that in a minute. But What's a Jewish talk without a Jewish story? And one of the great Yiddish proverbs is, why did God invent humankind? And the answer is because God loves stories. So here's our story. My husband and I had a log cabin up near the town of Fleischmanns, and we were talking to our neighbor who grew up in the Bronx. He was a kid in the Bronx in the 50s. And the family had a friend. Uh, he, he had that very rare commodity, and any of you who grew up in the 50s understand this immediately. He had a car. 
And so he would often come on the weekends and he would take the kids in the neighborhood all off for a ride. And he really liked doing things. And all the kids called him uncle, even though he wasn't really their uncle. And so one day they decided to go up to the Catskill Mountains and they're driving around in the Catskill Mountains. And he decided, well, it's time to get the kids. They're probably thirsty. Let's get them out. We'll go and have something to drink, maybe something to eat. And so he would stop at a hotel and he'd say to the kids, now just wait, I'll, I'll be back in a minute. And he'd come back looking very disappointed. He said, all right, let's go. And then they would drive around. Then he'd stop at another hotel. And he'd say, just wait a minute. I'm going to go inside. So he went inside and came back to support. Now, understand, these are kids don't really quite understand what's going on. But obviously, what's happening is no hotel is willing to serve these Jewish kids. So finally, after all of that, they drive up to the fanciest hotel the kids have ever seen. They're kids from the Bronx, they don't know from this. And they're looking, oh, this is great. And he said, now you just sit in the car. I promise I'll be right back. So he goes into the hotel and returns a few minutes later, says, all right, kids, come with me. So all the kids march in and their good behavior because oh, they have never seen such a fancy schmancy place before. And they're all sitting in the lobby and this is, oh, this is great. And, 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 and then the bellman came by announcing, telephone call for Mr. Goldstein, telephone call for Mr. Goldstein. And to this day, Bob remembers the rattling of the teacups when people were horrified that there was a Jew in their hotel. And so their uncle turned to the bellman, gave him a $5 bill and turned to the kids said, all right, kids, we can go now. And that's the beginning of our story of the Catskills. The early Catskills were a remarkable place in Jewish history, but it's often confused. So today we're gonna to look at New York Catskill Mountains discovering five small and very different communities. And I want to underscore these are the only communities in the Catskill Mountains that will allow Jews. Now, the talk will include a bit about New York State geography, the Catskill Mountains and their role in American history. We'll discuss discrimination and widespread anti-Semitism in the Catskill communities. We'll take glimpses of the five communities that did embrace Jews, which were Fleischmanns, High Mount, Tannersville, Hunter, and Sharon Springs. And the talk will also set the stage for part two of this series, which will focus on more recent and more legendary resorts in the Shongunk Mountains. And these, of course, are names that most people are familiar, Grossinger's, Kutcher's, the Concord, the Neville. It's important to remember, none of those were ever in the Catskill Mountains. So the Jewish Catskills is a complex and wide ranging subject. So that's why we ended up having to divide this talk into two parts. So today's, we, today we're going to focus on the very earliest of the submarine communities that did permit Jews. We're not going to include the ones in the Shongok Mountains because as I said, none of those places that were the Borscht Bell resorts were in the Catskill Mountains. So what's going on? Well, we'll explain that too. I will state that the Shangguk Mountain venues will be addressed in part two. Understand that the Catskills were restricted. Understand that virtually any non-Jew understood the Catskills were restricted. Most Jews understood the Catskills were restricted. So when Jewish farmers would move into the Shangguk Mountains, they started as farmers and they would, would be, uh, trying to farm the land. And let's face it, it's not great soil. It's not great. It, it, they weren't doing so hot. And they figured out that people would be willing to pay to stay in their farm over the summer. Little by little, the farms became little hotels, became big hotels. And Grossinger started out with a little teeny tiny farmhouse. So of course, the newspapers, which were not pro-Jewish at all, immediately started referring to the Shangonks as the Jewish Catskills. You know, the Jews can't really live in the Catskills, so this is the best they can do. And what happened is so many people took up that insult that it got to be common. I always point out that the Quakers, which are not the Quakers, the Society of Friends, were often nicknamed the Quakers because people would see them in a spiritual moment quaking. And finally, the Quakers assumed it. And you actually visit my friends' meetings houses, they'll say Quaker meeting house. And it's the same thing. The Jews simply took the insult and they turned it into something positive. Borscht Belt, likewise, was a newspaper reporter's negative commentary about 
the, the Catskill Mountains. But if you're Jewish and you really miss the you know, home cooking and you miss you know, the food and the people and the crowds and the family, Borschfeld doesn't sound so bad. And so Borschfeld became as equally a, a Jewish commentary as it did a non-Jewish commentary. So where are the Catskill Mountains and what the heck makes them so special? I'm going to show you on the map, and we'll hope my mouse works. If you look at the top, we'll see a red, oops, we'll see my slide move. You'll see a red arrow. That is the beginning of the Hudson River. The Hudson River is a 315 mile long river that starts with a little tidy lake in Mount Marcy in the Adirondack Mountains called Lake Tear of the Clouds. I've always loved that name. So it tumbles on down and then passes by Saratoga Springs. And then one of the communities we'll include in today's talk, although technically it's not in the Catskills, will be Sharon Springs because they share a commonality with the other communities we'll be discussing. As the river continues on down, off to the left, you'll see a sign that says Catterskill Falls. That's in the Catskill Mountains. And that would be the beginning of not only our story, but the American story. As you continue on down, we'll see the sign for the Catskill Mountains and continuing on down. If you look to the left, you'll see a sign that says Shogoks. That's where Kutcher's, Nevely, all of those places are. It's a totally different mountain chain. And as I said, they were nicknamed the Jewish Catskills because God knows those Jews should never come to the Catskills themselves. So the towns we're going to focus on are Fleischmann's in the adjacent little hamlet of High Mount, Tannersville, and Hunter will also include a visit to Sharon Springs. So here are the Catskill Mountains. What's not to love? Look at this beautiful scenery here. You see the Hudson River winding its way. There's these very soft, gentle mountains. The, Hudson, the Catskill Mountains are some of the oldest mountains in the United States. And what that means is as time has gone on, they've worn them smooth. They're not rugged, rocky mountains like the Rocky Mountains. They're gentle mountains and they're very, very beautiful. Many people know that classic American story by the man who was once America's most important writer, Washington Irving. His tale is Rip Van Winkle. It was the most popular 19th century play. Virtually every major performer played Rip Van Winkle. You could almost find at least five theaters in New York at any one time in the 19th century with someone performing Rip Van Winkle. It's a story of a man whose wife is as they describe in the story, a bit of a termagant. Uh, she's a shrew and, and, and Rip is sort of one of those you know, all right, I'll do with this. So one day his wife is just really making life miserable for him. So he goes off and, and he's in the woods and he bumps into these funny looking Dutch guys wearing old fashioned Dutch costumes. They're playing an old Dutch game called bowls, what we would call bowling. And they're drinking flagons from this very wonderful, wonderful uh, elixir. And so they offer some to, to Rip, Rip drinks it and wakes up a hundred years later to an entirely different world. Now, the importance of that story is that this story would make the Catskill Mountains popular across the planet. Washington Irving was not only the most beloved author in the United States, he was beloved in Europe as well. But let's, for our story, start with the first phrases of that tale. Whoever has made a voyage up the Hudson must remember the Catskill Mountains. Every change of the season, every change of weather, indeed every hour of the day, produces some change in the magical hues and shapes of these mountains, and they are regarded by all the good wives far and near as perfect barometers. When the weather is fair and settled, they are clothed in blue and purple. That's why I'm wearing a purple shirt. They're clothed in blue and purple and print their bold outlines on the clear evening sky. But sometimes, when the rest of the landscape is cloudless, they will gather a hood of gray vapors about their summits, which in the last rays of the setting sun will glow and light up like a crown of glory. Although Washington Irving was himself not Jewish, to many Jewish immigrants, Washington Irving with his magical tales of the Catskill Mountains was the consummate American. And what happened is so many Jewish parents started naming their sons Irving for Washington Irving, that soon people started thinking Irving was a Jewish name. Now, in the 19th century, there were major forces that converged all at the same time. Number one, the United States was a new country and we felt it was our obligation to prove that we were not only equal, but often superior to Europe. 
At the same time, there was a religious movement called the transcendental movement. And the idea was since we cannot face God face to face, we must go to nature to communicate with God. Understand when, when the people who came with Maple Dodge Lujan and others and saw the spirituality of the New Mexico landscape, it's the same thought process going on. In the 19th century, there is another invention that many people have heard of. It's called the middle class. Most people think the middle class was with us always. Not so true. The earliest, absolute earliest one could put the middle class would be to 1830. What happened was the industrial revolution and that's what created the middle class. With the creation of the middle class came new concepts. Women stopped working outside of the house. We forget that women you know, there were always two jobs in every family. The idea of a woman staying home was one of those signs of the new wealth. And then a woman's job would change. She would become the mother, the caretaker of the home, the hearth, and the family. Now, it, the other thing that came out because of this is we suddenly had leisure, something that people had never had before. And so a brand new idea is inter, inter, interjected into our culture, vacation. Nobody had ever taken a vacation before the 19th century. At the same time, the railroad train has been invented, thus making it quicker and easier and much more luxurious to travel to distant places. Now, the Hudson River paintings by the Hudson River artists were viewed across the nation. Painters didn't have galleries. So what they would do is they would send the paintings from town to town to town. People would pay an admission fee to go look at the paintings. And what they saw were the great Hudson River paintings that we'll show you in just one minute. So in a real way, although they weren't travel posters, they basically were travel posters, come to the Catskills. And then add to that, of course, those wonderful and beloved tales of Washington Irving, which not only includes uh, Rip Van Winkle, but the legend of Sleepy Hollow and all of that the Catskills would become a destination. Now, in the early 19th century, the fledgling American nation was looking for a separate identity, something that was different than Europe. A group of artists would find the answer to that question in the spiritual beauty and majesty of the natural world when they traveled up the Hudson River Valley and went to the Catskill Mountains. This art movement, which was the very first art movement in American history, is called the Hudson River School. I want to clarify, there's no academic regime here. This is simply a group of painters who shared similar philosophical beliefs. And the Hudson River School painters believe that art should be a teacher. Art should train you, it should help you, it should be moral, it should be spiritual. When you look at a painting, you should be transformed. That's the function of art. And in their, what they did to create this effect would be large scale canvases of dramatic vistas with atmospheric lighting. And a very important thing is virtually every Hudson River painting, you'll see a direct shaft of light. And I want you to think of that, the, the symbol of Moses when Moses steps down from Mount Sinai and the word got mistranslated into horns, but that's not what it means in Hebrew. It means Moses was radiant. He was radiant with light. And you see God's light coming down into the paintings. The idea was nature is God's handiwork and the Hudson River Valley was a brand new Garden of Eden. Look at the painting by Paul Weber in front of you, and you will see in the distance the beautiful skies, those soft, gentle, wooded hills of the Hudson River, those wonderful deciduous trees tumbling down, and then the light shining directly onto the waterway and onto the rocks. It takes you to a spiritual place. And that spiritualism did not miss a man named William Cullen Bryant one of America's most famous poets. He was published in Europe when he was 13 years old. He believed in the sanctity of nature and he believed that God lived in nature. So these artists are, are he understands them totally. William Cullen Bryant would become one of the major supporters of the Hudson River artists uh, that anyone could find. He wanted to take the spirituality of the Catskill Mountains and bring it to Manhattan because he was the publisher of the New York Evening Post, which I know it's hard to believe was once one of the most respected newspapers in the nation, um, he would promote the creation of the park. And it was specifically designed to be the Catskill Mountains, but in Manhattan. 
And if you've ever wandered through Central Park, you can see the hills, the rolling rocks, you can see the little hideaways, it's all waterfalls. It's a magical, magical place. The park was designed by a British architect named Calvert Fox. His assistant was a newspaper reporter named Frederick Law Olmsted, who until Central Park, the only gardening he'd done was his garden in Staten Island. It always strikes me as amazing that people want to credit Olmsted for the design of the park. He did not. Now, what would also happen because of this school of painting would be a, uh, an academy would be founded, the American answer to the Royal Academy in Britain. And so we see the National Academy of Design, which we founded in 1825. It's the oldest art academy in the country. And uh, what's very nice is as soon as it opens, it'll open soon. And as soon as the museum opens, there is a show from the National Academy of Design at the New Mexico Museum of Art. This is one of the paintings in that show called Bash Bish by one of the most famous painters. And again, look at all the quantities, the idea of the spirituality of the environment, God's light shining on into the environment. Now, all of this would, none of this would have been able to come about except for a fellow named Cornelius Vanderbilt, whose high school project was he started the Staten Island Ferry. But he would go on to become the greatest railroad magnet in the country. His first major railroad was the Hudson River Line. And you can see the Empire State Express steam engine going up. And if you look to the left of your image, you'll see people in this very luxurious train. If any of you are familiar with the Billy Joel song, New York State of Mind, he talks about taking the Hudson River Line. This is the train he's talking about. The destination would be Catterskill Falls. Catterskill Falls is the highest waterfall in the state of New York, and it's a double fall. So you can see the water tumbling from high above the hill, falling down to a lower level, and then tumbling down again. It's a magical fall and still a major destination for visitors to New York State today. In one minute, I'm going to show you the most famous painting from the 19th century. Our critics consistently, consistently I'll try that in English, consistently agree that the painting I'm about to show you, Kindred Spirits by Asher B. Duran, is one of the greatest paintings. What it'll do is take all those ideas we've been discussing about Hudson River paintings and fuse it with the two men responsible, Thomas Cole, the founder of the, of the Hudson River School, and that great advocate of Hudson River paintings and the nature, William Cullen Bryant. You can see Thomas Cole with his portable easel in his hand. He's wearing his straw hat. And to his right and to our left, holding the obligatory walking stick, because you can't go to the mountains without a walking stick. And that is William Cullen Bryant. The idea is here are two friends who have in common, they are kindred spirits, what they have in common is that idea that God lives in nature. So the Catskill Mountains would become the very first vacation land of the United States. And what would set that off would be a very luxurious hotel found, uh, created in 1825, 1824 within walking distance of Catterskill Falls. The guests at this hotel would make day trips to go visit Catterskill Falls, have a picnic, do all of that. According to the postcard, I think it's a little bit of hyperbole. You could see for 12,000 miles into the valley of the Hudson River. Now, the first Jew on record to be entertained at a resort in the Catskills was in 1824 when Mordecai Manuel Noah stayed at the Catskill Mountain House. Now, a little interesting piece is that 1825, a year later, Mordecai Noah would try to establish, he would lay the dedication stone for Ararat, a city of refuge for the Jews. Now understand the state of Israel is nowhere near existence yet. He wants to create a separate community for Jews. Why? Because of prejudice, quite frankly. And he wanted to create, if any of you have ever been to Niagara Falls, you actually pass through what was Ararat in order to go to Niagara Falls. That never happened. However, back to the uh, Catskill Mountain House, in 1839, a man named Charles Beach would lease the mountain house from its owners. And with the new management came new guidelines. To discourage a Jewish clientele, the new management generously provided mandatory Sunday church services for all hotel guests. Now, because of the beauties of the Catskill Mountain and the Hudson River, Hudson River Valley, many artist colonies were created. Many of you have undoubtedly heard of the arts-oriented Catskill Mountains village of Woodstock, New York. Now, 
Woodstock, New York to this day calls itself the colony of the arts. One of the major landmarks of Woodstock is uh, Birdcliff Art Colony. It's on the National Register of Historic Places. It was founded in 1902 by Jane Bird McCall. And you can see that's the first half of Birdcliff and Ralph Radcliffe Whitehead. You can see it was a husband and wife duo. That's quite a romantic place, this arts and crafts space with these beautiful wooded uh, interiors and heavy beams and, and stone fireplaces. It's a magical, magical place. And as I said, it's on the National Register and this is their historic plaque, which says Birdcliff on the hill above in 1902 are our Whitehead led workers in many arts and crafts to try and experiment in utopian living. Now, like historic plaques, you can't put everything on the plaque. So there's one thing I'd like to point out that's missing. R.R. Whitehead consciously selected the town of Woodstock, New York, because to him, utopia could never include Jews. The village of Woodstock was restricted and no Jews were ever permitted to own land in Woodstock. They were not allowed to stay at hotels. They were not allowed to eat in the dining rooms. And for that specific reason, Whitehead chose Woodstock to be his art colony. Now, the irony of this is that today, if you visit Woodstock, a tremendous number of the residents of Woodstock are today Jewish. Now, at the foot of the Catskill Mountains is Mohonk Mountain House, overlooking this very beautiful, rugged Lake Mohonk. It was founded initially as a small little resort in the 1870s by two Quakers, the Smiley Brothers. Now, uh, located above the, the lake, you can see it's, the building has been added onto and added onto and add to, added onto its tremendously popular place. However, they did discourage Jewish guests. And this is from a 1917 house manager's report. Hebrews are few. William W. Cohen, a high class Hebrew, rather insisted on coming, even after learning that he would probably be unwelcome. It only took him three days for him to realize his mistake. Here is, and I, I myself have seen this letter. I was not able to obtain a copy for this show, but this is in the American Jewish Historical Society. This is an actual letter. On Monday, on uh, the morning of June, 1922, a letter arrived in the home of Mr. and Mrs. Morris Felberg of Accord, New York. Uh, the letter bore the elegant crest of the Mohonk Mountain House and the Felbergs were very excited because they had applied for a job there. And just to clarify, Awkward is within 10 minutes of, of Mohawk Mountain House, like right around the corner. Dear Mr. and Mrs. Felberg, we are in receipt of your letter to Mr. DeWitt and wish to state that we do not employ people of your race. Trusting that our delay in answering you has not caused you too much inconvenience, I am very truly yours, J.W. Smith. I want to underscore something most people do not know. Jews were not considered white by the American government until after World War II. Up until then, there were always the Hebrew race or some variation, the Israelite race. A very common sign in the Catskills would read like the one you see in front of you, Hebrews will knock vainly for admission. Not everyone was so, shall we say, graceful, uh, some were a little more blunt. Jews were consistently made to feel unwelcome in most towns in the Catskill Mountains into the 1960s. It would be not until the 1964 Civil Rights Act that finally made it illegal to discriminate against Jews. And even though after the 50s, things were winding down, there was still discrimination against Jews in the Catskills until finally the law said no. So let us look at our map. Our first towns will be Griffin Cornets and High Mount. Just to position you, here is the Hudson River. This map is actually the day line uh, that was the cruise ship that took you to the Catskills. If I may point out, uh, the uh, Shawangunk Mountains are down here because they're not in the Catskills. So they're not on the map. But if you look here, we're going to do number one. And number one will be the town of Griffin Corners and High Mount. Griffin Cornets and the adjacent hamlet of a high mount were two of the very few villages in the Catskill Mountains that were welcoming to Jews. Here's the town of High Mount, very charming little town. I love the sign that says ice cream soda. Um, they have a very quaint little town. And what happened was, you will see in just one minute, 
Uh, here, if we look at the image, you'll see that the town has these very typical balconies. And the reason for the balconies is remember, in, air conditioning has not been invented yet. So you go to the mountains for the cool air. When Lewis and I lived in the Catskills where we lived for a number of years, we never used air conditioning. Now, those of you who've been in New York in the summer, try to live in New York in the summer without air conditioning. It's quite amazing. There's a tremendous difference. Now, all of this would come about because the Ulster and Delaware Railroad would bring the train to Griffin Corners. But in 1883, Hungarian-born Hungarian Charles Louis Fleischmann purchased 160 acres of property west of Griffin Corners. I want to say that the people of the town were very excited by this possibility because they thought Mr. Fleischmann might be a good addition to the town. Indeed, he proved to be more than a good addition. So prior to this, in 1868, Fleischmann had joined with his brother Maximilian and a friend from, from Hungary named James Gaff in Cincinnati, Ohio. Just to clarify, for those of you who don't know, Cincinnati had a very large German population and a very large German Jewish population, which explains why the Hebrew Union College, which is a reform seminary, would be founded in Cincinnati. Remember, the German Jews were products of the Enlightenment. Germany was one of the very first countries on the planet Earth to give Jews the right of citizenship. So it was a major change. But Fleischmann's company was famous for yeast. It was make famous for breads. It was famous for liquors. And since they were in, in Cincinnati, which is a German town, they were famous for their beers. Here you see Fleischmann's yeast, eat three cakes daily. All right, I want you to go out and eat your three cakes of yeast a day. This was considered to be the great health product of the time. On the right-hand side, you'll see an image of a young woman holding all sorts of breads and, and baked goodies made with Fleischmann's yeast. Now, this relatively new company would have a great coup when in 1876, we celebrated the centennial of the United States. Philadelphia had the second World's Fair in the country, and this was the building that a relatively new baking company built at the World's Fair. Look at that structure. I don't know about you, but I am amazed when I look at that. And what this did was because people came from all over the United States to go to the World's Fair, it made Fleischmann's yeast a household name. Now Fleischmann's bakeries would be famous, but I want to point out that the Fleischmann's believed in Sadaka. And so at the end of every day, they did not dispose of baked goods. Every day new baked goods were baked, so everything would be fresh. But at the end of every day, they gave any remaining breads or pastries to the poor. And the Fleischmanns invented the bread line. Soon after the arrival of the Fleischmann family, other wealthy German Jewish families would build grand summer houses with porches and turrets and terraces. Remember, we're in the, in the late 19th century. So they would also create, and this is an amazing thing. Imagine you live in a small town in the mountains. For the community, they built a deer park, a riding stable, a heated pool with spring water, and a trout pond, all of which were usable by the residents. The Fleischmann's family outfitted the Fleischmann's Griffin Corners band with uniforms. And the band was so overjoyed that what they would do on a consistent basis was the Fleischmann's train cars were coming into town, the whole band would come together and welcome them with a musical interlude. Now, many wealthy German Jews would construct summer homes. I'm not going to go through the whole list, but let's give you a few. Herbert Lehmann, who is the governor of the state of New York in 1932, the Lehmann family, probably not a name you know, but many of you probably remember Gold beer that was one of their major beers, and Anton Seidel, who is the conductor of the Metropolitan Opera. Now, here is another gift of the Fleischmann's family, and you can look and see what they've done. If you look on the lower left of your screen, you'll see a dam being constructed. Those are all those people saying, oh, let's go look at the dam and get our picture taken. The dam would then be filled. And if on the right hand side, you see the waterfall that would from the dam. And if you look on the upper scene, you'll see Lake Switzerland, a lake built by the Fleischmann family for the community. This was a great, great addition for all. And they stocked the lake with trout. 
So Fleischmann's New York was originally, as I said, called Griffin Corners. But what happened is people were so impressed by what the Fleischmann's had done, they decided to name the town Fleischmann's. And that's how the town got its name. Now, I want you to think in your lifetime how many times you've ever been to it, how many times you've been to a town that was named for a Jew. And especially in the Catskills, that's a pretty amazing statement. One of the things that the Fleischmanns did is they had a baseball team in Cincinnati and they also supported the baseball team in Fleischmanns and they were among the very few non-African-American financial supporters of what were called the colored baseball leagues. And this is the group called the Cuban Giants who came to play in the baseball field created by the Fleischmanns in downtown Fleischmanns. This is the Fleischmann house. It's the only one that remains of about a dozen houses that the family built on their family compound. And this gives you a little sense. This is not the entire compound, but it's a good part of the compound. You can see what a tremendous change to the landscape this was. One of the young men who grew up in that compound was a man named Raoul Fleischmann. It was a nephew of Charles Fleischmann. And uh, while he spent most of his summers there, as an adult, he would become a regular attendee at the Algonquin Round Table at Manhattan's Algonquin Hotel. This is a famous literary salon of many noted writers, but in 1925, uh, 24, Raoul Fleischmann decided that he would fund the launch of a brand new magazine. One of his friends at the Algonquin Round Table got him very excited about this project, and he would invest over $700,000. I, I I want you to do some mental math. That's 1924. We're talking millions of dollars before the, new, the magazine would be successful. Some of you have already figured out what I'm speaking of. What he was supporting was New Yorker magazine. And Raoul Fleischmann would remain the publisher of New Yorker until his demise in 1969. Because it's a German Jewish town, the synagogue is a reform synagogue. There's a congregation, B'nai Israel, and it's still very much a functioning synagogue. Here is the interior. You can see the very beautiful ark in the sanctuary. One of the residents in the adjacent hamlet, it's not really, didn't have a town center or anything, it was called High Mount, I was the Sephardic Jewish Italian coloratura soprano named Amalita Galakurci. Amalita Galakurci, who you may or may not know, was in the early part of the 20th century one of the most popular opera singers in the country. And not only did she sing opera, she also sang popular songs. And if any of you want to go searching a little later today on YouTube and type in Amalita Galakurchi, you're going to find a whole array of, of, of songs that are on YouTube. She's still very well loved today. And one of the songs she was most famous for was Home Sweet Home. You can see the RCA Victor uh, record label uh, written by a Jew named John Howard Payne who lived in East Hampton, New York. And what many people don't know is that there actually is a home for John Howard Payne. And that photograph on the right-hand side is his home. It's now a museum. And for reasons you can only well imagine is known as home sweet home. The famous lines, and I want you to think of this as a Jew, mid pleasures and palaces, though we may roam, be it ever so humble, there's no place like home. One of the things that you will find, and it's not time in today's talk, is a recurrent theme throughout Jewish music. There's a place for us somewhere. I originally had conceived of starting this presentation with Over the Rainbow in Mama Lotion in Yiddish. And when you hear Over the Rainbow sung in the language spoken by the people who wrote the song, it becomes a very, very different song. It's about that search for homeland. And so homeland keeps running through all of our story. Now look at this, talk about home sweet home. I show this most because it's such a dramatic view. These are the Catskill Mountains. You're looking down on Amalita Galakurchi's home. Look at this house, which is very much extant, uh, a very lovely, lovely home. It has stone roof, half timbers, stone details, and this very charming entrance. I love the entrance with the vine. It sort of says, come on in, come on in, this is home. And you come into this grand salon. Now I want you in your mind to stand 
where you are sitting or standing right now and pretend that you are Amalita Galakurchi. Your guests have all come in through the door and they're seated in chairs in front of you. And then you dramatically step out from your balcony, look down over your worshiping crowd and break out in a dramatic aria. This is a splendid place for an operatic performance. Now, right near her house was the Grand Hotel, which was one of the largest hotels in the history of the United States, built by the Ulster and Delaware Railroad in 1881. It did not close until 1966. The hotel was a, an eighth of a mile long. I want you to think about how long that hotel is. Um, uh, they was built with four viewing towers so that you not only could see the, the beautiful scenery, but also to catch the breezes, very important. The Grand Hotel would appeal to a very high class of clientele and actually outlasted the railroad for more than three decades. Now, the Grand Hotel would have many, many guests. I'm not going to go through it, but I'll just say a few. There was Oscar Wilde, the famous uh, uh, playwright and dramatist. Uh, there was the department store magnate Louis Sturd, and the very famous financier Jay Gould. Um, now, here's a true story that seems almost apocryphal. I want you to look at the length of that hotel and realize it was built on the boundary line between two counties. So half of the hotel was in Ulster County and half of the hotel was in Greene County. This is also very good for tax purposes because if you found the taxes were more onerous in one county than the other, you simply moved your office from one end of the hotel to the other. But one of the things that, that did happen is that the Grand Hotel applied for a, li a liquor license in Ulster County and they were turned down. So what do you do? You move the bar to the other end of the hotel. They're now in Green County. Green County says, yeah, sure. So they get a license. That's the beginning of the temperance movement, which I often point out is the beginning of the women's movement. Another day, another tour. But the temperance leaders in Green, Green County got hostile to the bar. And by that time, the people in Ulster County realized, wait a minute, we're missing out on all those tax dollars. So they made it legal to drink in Ulster County. So they simply moved the bar to the other end of the hotel. Now, near the hotel was the Weingart Institute in the town of Highmount. This is a postcard. So look at the postcard there of this very handsome structure. And I have uh, reproduced the back of the postcard, but it's a little hard to read. So I've included here uh, a, the, the content. It says, scene went on a hike from Gala Kirchie's new home and from the Grand Hotel, place where the Fleischmann High School basketball team plays on Saturdays. Now, what the heck was the Weingart Summer Institute? Well. For those who've never heard of it, it was one of the very first Jewish summer camps in American history. It was sponsored by the very highly respected Weingart Institute in Harlem on 7th Avenue. And those of you who are with me for my Jewish Harlem lecture, this is the heart of German Jewish Harlem. The synagogue where many of the campers would go to was two blocks away from High Mount and the synagogue is still there. Now, Hollywood and television screenwriter, playwright, and a former Weingart camper named Sid, Sig Herzig would refer to the camp as a prep school for a musical hall of fame. So who went there? Oscar Hammerstein II and his brother Reggie. Herbert Sondheim would become the father of the famous Broadway uh, uh, songwriter and playwright Stephen Sondheim. Teddy Hart and his older brother Lorenz Hart, who often went by the nickname Larry, and Larry, Larry Hart's musical partner, Richard Rogers. These are all classmates. And just to give you an idea of the prestige of this summer camp, here is from the Social Diary of the Richmond Times in Richmond, Virginia, Sunday, June 29th, 1902. Master William B. Tallheimer, the son of Isaac Tallheimer, left for New York last Monday to attend the Weingart Summer Institute at High Mount in the Catskill Mountains. He will be absent until the 5th of September. And I'm including the next photograph because what can you do with a summer camp without people at the swimming pool? And so these are both the young men and the young women at the Weingart Institute. Now, we're not going to leave the town of Fleischmann without saying, giving a nod to one of my favorite women in the history of American culture, and that is Gertrude Berg. Born as Gertrude Edelstein, she would marry Louis Berg, and she would create a character named Molly Goldberg, one of the most beloved characters in American history. Now, when Gertrude uh, Edelstein was growing up, her her father was more or less a single father, so he owned an inn in Fleischmann's. Now, 
because it's a small family, Gertrude has to help her father. And so she does the entertainer. She's a tumbler, the performer, the actor, the singer, the dancer. And one of the characters she invented at that little inn in Fleischmann's was a character named Molly Goldberg, the consummate Yiddish mama. The character would ultimately change American radio, it would change American television, and ultimately would become a very popular movie. Molly Goldberg was, and I want to point out that Gertrude Berg spoke with an Oxonian accent. She was very proper. She was dressed by Meinbacher. She was, you know, this is a well-heeled woman, but she understood the character. And what I want to say about her that's interesting is that while she didn't live her life as Molly Goldberg, she had all of those embracing qualities that made her so welcome to so many, many, many American homes. You didn't have to be Jewish to appreciate the struggles of an immigrant family. And she brought it home. One of the great things that she did was on radio, she did the first live Seder in American history but it was done to embrace the audience so people would understand what was going on. People were taken away by it. She would uh, be the second most famous woman in the United States. I do want to point out that what happened is Lewis had lost his job with the early uh, onset of the depression. She realized someone needed to make money. So she hand wrote her, her text for Molly Goldberg and went to NBC. They, they looked at her and said, Mrs. Berg, we can't read your handwriting. She said, that's okay, I'll perform it for you. She performed it and, and they were taken away. She walked away with a job and she would then continue. She was her own script writer, own director, performed other things. And she would be the woman who would set the stage for people like Loretta Young, Donna Reed, uh, Lucille Ball and Oprah Winfrey. She really would pave the way, but she never forgot her Fleischmann's roots and Molly Berg, Gertrude Adelstein Berg is still interred in Fleischmann's. You can visit her gravesite and you can see the rocks there. Actually, one of those rocks is one that Lewis and I placed there. Now, just to clarify, there were other ethnic Catskills. Now, Jews aren't the only ones suffering from discrimination. So the town of East Durham became the Irish Catskills. There were the Italian Catskills, the Swiss Catskills, the Ukrainian Catskills, the German Catskills, and the Greek Catskills. Now, what happened to them? Well, they're pretty much winding down. So why did the Catskills fall out of favor? By the 1950s, the world had changed. Something called the three A's, air conditioning, airplanes, and assimilation. And those three things, no longer did you have to go to the country to get cool air. And with airplanes, which remember were subsidized by the United States government, travel to unusual places was relatively inexpensive. So why don't we go to Europe this time? Assimilation, you didn't need to cluster with people who were of, of uh, similar ethnicity. Now we're going to travel a little bit further up in the Catskill Mountains, a little to the, west, uh, to the east, and we're going to the town of Tannersville. Tannersville is a beautiful area. Look at this photograph there of Tannersville. And Tannersville, a 200 year history began with small hemlock tree tanneries, hence the name. And the problem was they ended up using all the trees and they destroyed the virgin forest. So it was basically gone. Now, like, unlike Fleischmann's Tannersville, became and still remains a distinctly divided town. Jewish and Gentile worlds were right next to each other, but they rarely, rarely mingled. Contiguous to Tannersville in 1887, there was a secluded and exclusive rustic community called Antioro Park created by Candace Wheeler. Uh, Candace Wheeler was one of America's very first women interior designers. Her partner, and I say that partner, it was not, she was not an employee, her partner was Louis Comfort Tiffany in the firm of Associated Artists. Just to give you a sense, the fabric that I've included in the back of this slide is one of the fabrics she designed. She conceived on Tiara Park as a, a well-heeled artistic summer community. This is not a Newport, this is not a Lenox, Massachusetts, this is for artists and writers. 
Residents of Antiora Park and then subsequent neighborhoods of Twilight Park and Elka Park included Candace Wheeler, the prominent actress Maude Adams, who would be like uh, having a major, major performer in your neighborhood, uh, Mary Mapes Dodge, who would become famous for Hans Brinker or the Silver Skates. Mark Twain would visit his house in, uh, in uh, Connecticut, would be designed by Candace Wheeler uh, and Louis Comfort Tiffany. Uh, members of the Colgate family and Valentine. Valentine Everett Macy, among other, uh, other people. Now, surprisingly, and this is very rare for American communities, the community offered a haven for single women. There, there were a tremendous number of single women who were trying to strive to become financially independent. This house is one of the houses very much extant there in Antioro Park and was built by the, for the Roberts family. If you've ever been to Philadelphia, the Roberts family was the one who gave all of those talents those funny Welsh names because they were part of the original Welsh investors in Philadelphia with William Penn. One of the houses that still remains is Hathaway. This is a home of Valentine Everett Macy, who's a, a relative of the Macy family, but not direct in line. <coughs> Give you an idea of the cachet of the house. It was designed by Society of Architects Delano and Aldrich. That's Delano of Sarah Delano Roosevelt and Aldrich of Abby Aldrich Rockefeller. Macy's father had been a major executive with Standard Oil. And when he died in 1876, remember when the Fleischmanns did that, that wonderful exhibit at the Philadelphia World's Fair, a five-year-old Valentine Everett Macy inherited over 20 million 19th century dollars. And anyone wants to Google that later, it's countless millions of dollars. Now, according to an 1897 article in Godey's Magazine, the requirements for membership in these communities were native refinement, intelligence, and an introduction by some person already within the charm circle. Godey's Magazine, for those not familiar, is the number one women's magazine in America. They are the trendsetters, the taste setters. They would show the latest in fashions. I want to point out that Jews were never included in this charm circle at Antiora. Antiora is still a very desirable community. And even though Tannersville has become largely Jewish, Antiora still remains pretty much not Jewish. So what would happen with Tannersville was in the 1800s to the 1830s became a really big time because they'd already built all of these boarding houses and rooming houses for all the workers and the tanneries and the forest. And when the, uh, when the railroad would come to town, these boarding houses were there and they said, Jews, sure. You know, I've got spaces to fill. And so it de facto became a Jewish town. And what's interesting is of the few towns in the Catskills that were historically Jewish, this town is still largely Jewish. The, by 1902, there were 52 hotels and boarding houses. By 1920, there were over 100 boarding houses, many of them specifically for Jewish clientele. And when I say that, understand what that means is their food is kosher. They are, and you can read the side, there are lots of coded words in the advertisements that will say, some will just say Gentiles only, but some will say all, all uh, dietary observances uh, addressed. So here is a little town, sort of looks like a little bit of a, a hate ash but this is the colors of downtown Tannersville. One of the great property owners was Macy's department store co-owner, Nathan Strauss and his wife, Lena. And the, the Strausses were always tremendously generous. And one of the things that Nathan Strauss started doing was to provide pasteurized milk to the poor. Now, this is something that probably most people don't even think about, but one of the major diseases in the 19th century and the early 20th century was undulant fever from unpasteurized milk. And children were dying because the milk they were drinking had not been pasteurized. So, so uh, Nathan Strauss made sure that the children got free pasteurized milk. And one of the places that served it is this very charming storybook cottage in the middle of Central Park. One of the other houses is Sunny Honeysuckle Rose, built by Dorothy Shaver. And again, not necessarily a household name today, but I think an important woman to look at. She was the very first woman in the United States to head a multi-billion dollar United States company, Lord and Taylor. And if any of you ever uh, remember the old Lord and Taylor, there was something called the Shaver look. She would become a major designer, major uh, 
a sort of a face for the company. By the 1880s, Jews started coming to Tannersville in sizable numbers. And in 1902, the community built Anche HaSharon Synagogue, right on Main Street. Now look at, you're in a town, they're building a synagogue on the Main Street that tells you the town is being accepted to Jews. But beyond that, look at this list. These are hotels paying for building the synagogue. I'm not gonna to read through the list, but just understand, I want you, next time you're trying to raise money for shul, go to a hotel and ask them how much they're willing to contribute to your shul. The, the businesses understood that the synagogue was important to the community. And so they gave sizable amounts of money to building the synagogue. Today, well, many, many kosher destinations in the Catskills are gone. In Tannersville, there's a large Orthodox and large Hasidic community, and Tannersville uh, is still quite running strong. Now, one of the most famous people from Tannersville was Solomon Schechter. Solomon Schechter would be most noted for the, uh, the Cairo Geniza, where there were over 400,000 documents found from the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem until the 19th century in the storeroom for the old uh, religious books and novels or whatever. Anything, remember in Judaism, if it's a religious document, it cannot be destroyed. It cannot be burn. You have to bury it like a human being. It has to have a funeral ceremony. Now, needless to say, synagogues are not, there are too many things going on. And so what they often would do is create a Geniza, which is the storeroom. And this Geniza was the greatest treasure trove of medieval manuscripts in the universe. So uh, he would be brought to New York for becoming the president of the first seminary in the United States to create rabbis. No longer European rabbis are going to have real American rabbis, and he would be brought over for that. He would be the founder of the United Con uh, Synagogue of Conservative Judaism, and he was essentially the architect of conservative Judaism. Now, one of the reasons the town was so successful was because of these two people. Uh, uh, they were the, the Goldings, Samuel and Annie Golding, who were Orthodox Jews. And I, I have yet to figure out what Samuel did for a living, but he made a a lot of money. There were a number of times when rabbis would come from Europe, from Lithuania, from Russia uh, uh, on a fundraising campaign, because if you're running a yeshiva, you need money. And, and there was definitely at least one, and I think two cases where Sam Golding turned to the rabbi and said, well, how much money do you expect to make? And he said, well, you know, I have to make at least. And Sam Golding would say, let me write you a check. So he would bring all of these great scholars to Tannersville. Now, when the synagogue was just a bit too hard to walk to for Sam as he got older, what he did is he arranged to have the synagogue cut in half and moved to beside his house. So what they did is they had horses and they drew each half of the synagogue down, plumped it next to Sam's house and put the synagogue back together. This is a postcard of the house and I'd like you to look a little, it might be a little hard to read, but on the lower left corner, it says the Little Jewish Church, Tannersville in the Catskills, New York. Now, one of the other great things that happened in Tannersville was the, the uh, Zionist Organization of America would have their initial meeting. This is a transformational uh, institution, a transformational agency, and it would take place at the Fairmount Hotel. Here's a photograph of some of the people at that meeting, Rabbi Samuel, uh, uh, Stephen Samuel Wise. Some of you may have gone to a Stephen Wise synagogue in the past. The Rabbi Solomon Schechter, we just pointed out. Uh, Rev Z. Hirsch Maslansky, Maslansky, who is the foremost Zionist speaker of the day. Rabbi Judah Magnus, founder of the American Jewish Committee and something for which I'll always be amazed, a founder of the New York City Kahila effort. For those who don't know what that's about, that's trying to get a bunch of Jews to agree to talk to each other. And there are all these different synagogues that were all, and his job, in his mind, and he did it remarkably well, as he got Orthodox congregations to talk to, uh, to, uh, to reform congregations, he got Sephardim to talk to Ashkenazim, it was amazing. And then, uh, what a near and dear to my heart, Abba Hillel Silver, uh, who was only 13 years old in the photograph, and he would found the first Zionist youth organization. Now, after World War II, numerous Hasidic Jews arrived in New York as refugees from the Shoah. Many of them have ended up and continue to live in the town of Tannersville, and that's where the vitalization. So the town is 
very largely uh, Hasidic or Orthodox. And today, if you visit the town on any summer's day, you can find members of the Satbar group, the Belts group, the Lubavitch group, Lubavitch is Benachem Mendel Schneerson, uh, the Bostoner group, which is interesting because it refers to the town of Boston. It's a, as an Hasidic group from Boston, the German Jewish group, there's a Litvish and a modern Orthodox group. Now, Moving up, if we see our next town will be right here, number three, and that's the town of Hunter. They're very close, they're less than two miles apart. Look at the Hunter, uh, countryside outside of Hunter. Here is the main street in the 1920s, this charming little country town. Imagine coming there in the summer just to get away from the crush of the city. One of the major transformational people of Hunter was Harry Fischel, who in 1904 would take a house on Main Street and expand it and make it into a vast country house. Today is a gigantic bed and breakfast. You can look at that. That was his house. And you can see it. It's now called the Fairlawn Inn. The next thing he did is he built a synagogue right across the street. Got to have a shul, right? Want to make it within walking distance. So he would build Kol Yisrael on Shea Hunter. It's now on the National Register. It's a still working shul. It's now, especially because of the changes in the neighborhood, it's a very orthodox. And sometimes the, the, uh, the rabbis who are holding services will be members of one of the, the uh, Hasidic groups. Harry Fischel started out his career working for the architectural form of Schneider and Herder. Those of you who've been with me in the past probably know that this is one of the most important synagogues ever built in New York City history. But he would, uh, Fischel would then say, eh, I want to start my own business. Surprise, surprise. So he goes off and becomes a developer. He becomes good friends with the performer Yaakov Adler and builds the first purpose-built Yiddish theater in American history, the Grand Theater. And if you look on the lower right, you can see that very, very handsome building which survived until the 1930s. And it's another day, another time, but Yiddish theater basically went into decline when the United States government made it very difficult for Jews to come into the United States in 1924. Isolationism is nothing new. Now, Harry Fischel, because he was good friends with all these people from the Yiddish theater said, hey, I got this great country place. Why don't you come up and stay with me? And so he would entice many. I'm just going to mention three. One would, of course, be Yaakov Adler, whose most famous piece was the Yiddish King Lear or Der Yiddisher Kenik Lear. And for those of you who can read Yiddish, you can see it's your Yiddisher King Lear. Um, uh, very famous performance. Now, for those who are not familiar with this play by Jacob Gordon, let me tell you, it starts at a Purim festival. So, you know, this is not your traditional Shakespeare. And for those of you who are always concerned because Shakespeare, Shakespeare's King Lear is so tragic, the Yiddish or King Lear has a happy ending. But one of the roles for which Yaakov Adler become famous would be his role of Shylock. In fact, he would be for many actors the consummate Shylock performer and many would emulate him. He was so famous that when they brought the Merchant of Venice to the Broadway stage, they brought in Yaakov Adler who did his entire part in Yiddish while the rest of the cast did their part in English. I think that's pretty amazing. You probably know the children. There's Luther, there's Stella, there's Celia. And Stella Adler would start her own, own school for performing arts. Probably her most famous student was this kid named Marlon Brando. Now, the other two people that I want to mention of the Yiddish theater in the town of Hunter, Boris and Bessie Tomaszewski, uh, these were the, the Barrymores of the Yiddish theater. They're both stunningly attractive. They're both incredibly talented. Uh, uh, Boris, who had an eye for the ladies, would always, even in the midst of the most serious drama, as he would stand on the stage because he had very sexy legs, he would expose his legs and it was said that women in the audience would swoon. Bessie was a major uh, forceful event and uh, they would not only move to Hunter, they would build their own Yiddish theater. And a number of their major pieces would have their premiere, not in New York City, but in Hunter at their great Yiddish theater. The theater was called Thomas Tomaszewski's Paradise Gardens. And I want you to understand what is that in Yiddish? That is Gan Eden, the Garden of Eden. And again, it's a quest for a homeland. This was the 
uh, place where one of the most famous pieces of the repertoire, the Jewish Yankee Doodle, we perform. And there is Bessie on the lower left, looking quite attractive. She was quite a woman. And uh, this piece was written specifically for Madame Tomaszewski, Hansche in America. And I want you to think about this because this was written for her. Yeah, and I want you to remember, we're talking at the turn of the 20th century. What a lady is Hansha. They laughed at her, but now she is admired. She's a suffragette, and it's for women's rights and independence. Now, that's a pretty amazing statement to be making, not just at the time, but on the stage to all the world. And if you don't know the Tomaszewskis, you probably have heard of their grandson, Michael Tilson Thomas, who simply dropped the Shevsky from his last part of his name. One final visit with Hunter, the Hunter Mountain Ski Resort. The property was purchased from Oscar Hammerstein's family who owned property in Hunter and was purchased by Orville and Izzy Slutsky. And they were major funders of the synagogue for many years. The Slutskys were sold this, this mountainside and, and they said, we're gonna build a ski slope. And said, it was, are you crazy? That's no ski slope, you can't ski on that. And they said, you wanna see? We were in, in construction. So they blasted the mountain into existence and created the ski slope. Now that's not enough. This is a Jewish story, right? So what do you do when it doesn't snow in the winter time? The Slutskys would pioneer a brand new technology called snowmaking. So if you go up to Angel Fire, if you go up to the Taos, to, uh, to Santa Fe, up to the mountains and ski on that artificial snow, you can credit to Orville and Izzy Slutsky from Hunter, New York. So we're now gonna make a quick zip further upstate to Saratoga Springs to the Grand Union Hotel, where in 1877, the financier Joseph Seligman, who had been a longtime patron of the hotel, ran into an unfortunate situation. Due to a long Just, story. Justin, uh, you've got about 10 minutes. Okay. 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 Thanks. Uh, thank you. Uh, so uh, he was denied a hotel room. That had never happened. I mean, uh, I can't say that the people in Saratoga Springs, which is basically where all the politicos from Albany went in the summer, were necessarily embracing of Jews, but let's face it, they had to do business with a lot of them. So uh, that that anti-Semitism was pretty much sort of under, under the table. But when Henry Hilton declared, no Israelite should be permitted to stop at this hotel, everyone followed in suit. So all of the well-to-do German Jews who've been coming to Saratoga Springs for years had to make a change in life. So where they went to is a town called Sharon Springs. And you'll see Sharon Springs right here, number four. And that will be our final town that we're going to visit. Sharon Springs had been a spa resort because it's naturally given uh, wonderful springs and good water. And that's where the German and Hungarian Jewish families would move to after they were no longer allowed to go to Saratoga Springs. You can see one of the families there in the front of one of their homes. Sharon Springs was known for its magnesium water, its iron rich water, its sulfur water, its bluestone water, which is purportedly good for the eyes. Now, what we're doing is that Americans are seeing Europeans going to Marienbad. They're going to the various spas in Europe. We have to be just like them. Here's the Magnesia Temple. And if you look on the top, you can see that grand arcade, which is where you relax for your mud baths and all of your, your uh, cleansing treatments. The most important hotel in town was the Pavilion Hotel, very prestigious hotel, sadly no longer with us. But in the beginning of the 20th century, the German Jewish community started shifting. You know, there were other places to go. And so Sharon Springs would become the magnet for a different group of Jews. These are the Jews that you might associate with what we think of when we say the Jewish Catskills. Not quite, this was a little before, but between about 1910 and 1930, middle class Jews would come. Sharon Springs in the late 1920s reported administering 100,000 baths per season. Now these are the spa baths. Here's the bathhouse here. You can see all these men. They're on vacation. Look how they're dressed. 
And here I suspect slightly posed, you can see all these happy patrons in the spa and there are the nurses because of course this is a medical facility. And here is the White Sulfur Company of the Imperial Baths, which went to the 1939 World's Fair and provided hot mud pack treatments. And so this German community would last until World War II and then the world changed. But Sharon Spings would have a new life. The West German government after World War II paid for medical care repara uh, reparations for those who survived the Shoah. And to the Germans, spa vacations are a mandatory uh, uh, requirement for anyone taking care of their health. They couldn't imagine a German not going to a spa. And so they automatically paid for these, German, these, these Jews to go to the spa. Many of the hotel guests at Sharon Springs had tattoo numbers from the camps. The properties were in decline. The landlords were basically, you know, the German government was paying for it, but they weren't paying tons of money. They didn't have wealthy clientele. Most immigrants, uh, most uh, survivors of the camp in this country topped out at $11,000 a year in income. They were not big wealthy people. But here is one of the grand hotels, which is sadly now in ruins. And here's one of the busboys, a guy named Edward I. Koch, who would later become mayor of the city of New York. Here are some images of Sharon Springs in that sort of in-between time when it's sort of an upper New York town and sort of an Hasidic town. It's in Hasidic man, a typical New York upstater. And here is one of the original fountains, but it's look how it's declined. Uh, in order for people to understand, they have to put a sign. And I put, I created the sign for you with all the mistakes and spelling and all the lowercase, uppercase, all that. The sign is hung by a coat hanger. And it says this exceptional drinking water is good for drinking also with an eye for the eyes and please put your empty cups in the garbage can. Thank you. And here are some images of Sharon Springs when it was dominantly uh, an Orthodox and Hasidic, mostly Satmar community. I love these three women on the bottom right here. They're all leaning back to back to back knitting, reading, doing things, and they're using each other for support. I'm sure there's some wonderful bit of symbolism in that. Here are some of the Orthodox men as they're in the street. Now you must understand that for upstate New Yorkers, this is sort of a rather unusual site, but they're paying the rent, whatever rent is being paid. Here are two men going to the mikvah, and many Reformed Jews don't really understand that both men and women go to mikvah and in, in very observant communities, men go on a regular basis to mikvah. This is the, the cleansing pool uh, to be reborn. Uh, there is the original synagogue, which started out in what today we would probably call the conservadoc synagogue. Today, they occasionally have an itinerant satmar rabbi come. Um, but uh, in the 70s or the 90s, Sharon Spring became a destination for the Hasidim and the ultra the Orthodox Jews, primarily because of the demise of the small kukalain, the kukalon, the small cooking houses in the Shangong Mountains. So the same demise of what happened to the Catskill Mountains that people think of the Borscht Belt, the Jewish Catskills, would also have an impact on the Orthodox community. Now for a brief time, Sharon Spring had sort of a bit of revitalization because for those who are not familiar with Hasidim, you must follow your Rebbe, you must be near your rabbi. And so when Rebbe Yoel Teitelbaum, who's the founder of the Satmar, would come to Sharon Springs, all of his followers would come. But when he died in 1979, that time pretty much passed. So these days, there are very few Jews who suffer in Sharon Springs. All of the historic bathhouses and spas in Sharon Springs are shuttered and are in very bad disrepair. But there have been changes. They are trying to make an historic, or have made an historic district. Sadly, the camp survivors have moved on to the world to come. But it's not quite the end of our story. In Sharon Springs was a very grand mansion called the Beekman Mansion, which was taken over by a gay couple from New York, who then created a reality television show called The Fabulous Beekman Boys. 
Josh Kilmer Purcell and Dr. Brent Ridge would purchase the historic Bakeman Mansion, and then they would do this reality television show. Now, because Dr. Brent Ridge had been the on-television doctor for Martha Stewart, what happened is both of them lost their jobs in the downturn of the economy, so they already had the house, so they moved there. But Martha Stewart kept her relationship with Dr. Brent Ridge, and so she would actually promote the Beekman Farm. And so the fabulous Beekman boys would actually suddenly be all over the country and people say, oh, I got to move there. So now several of the hotels have been refurbished, new businesses have been established. Many of the new residents and vacationers are gay men, mainly, mainly from New York City. And here is the American Hotel, which just a few years ago was falling down and it's been completely refurbished on the National Historic Registry of Places. There's their plaque for you to admire. So while there are hopeful signs and recent investments in the village, uh, what will happen to Sharon Springs is still in, in the wings, we're not sure. Whatever happens with Sharon Springs, we're pretty much certain that Sharon Springs as a Jewish destination is no longer. So today we've seen five communities, the only five communities in, in Catskill Mountains that welcomed Jews. Fleischmann's, Highmount, Tannersville, Hunter, Sharon Springs, each of these early Jewish Catskill Mountain summer communities helped pave the way for the subsequent generation of grand Jewish resort hotels in the Shangongs and elsewhere. Some of you I know used to go to the Jewish Catskills in New Jersey, for example. Now, that's a very exciting story, but for obvious reasons, we'll have to save that for next time. So thank you very much. Sano Irezio, stay healthy and strong. Thank you all very, very much. Justin, thank you. This was so interesting. And there has been a, a very active um, chat going on. Um, not so much questions, but really people sharing their experiences, uh, people who have had, whose uh, family has owned hotels, recalling their own experiences. So you've brought up lots of, I think, wonderful memories. Um, there's also an extended discussion in the chat line having to do with, um, I think your, your uh, comment earlier on about Jews not being considered to be white um, and uh, trying to, to uh, when, so when, so, uh, when were they not considered white and when, when were they considered white? And, I, the, the, uh, and that actually was a census, it was a census. Uh, in, in the I, sense of I don't know how much more time we have for questions. But oh, yes, please. There's a wonderful book called The History of White People. And it's a remarkable text because the basic concept of there is no such thing as a white person. There, it's, not, it's nothing. It's, it's a concept. It's an idea. And as such, it's fluid. White people depends on who's defining. And in the United States, until World War II, Jews are considered Israelite, Hebrews are considered something else, even on your census form. They would ask you if you were an Israelite. But what happened with World War II, because of the camps in Nazi Germany, because let's face it, how could you be anti-Jewish when this country went to war to save those people's lives? That was quietly shoved to the side. And but the real shift, that doesn't mean people don't change overnight. Suddenly you don't say yesterday, I really couldn't stand her, but today I think she's fabulous. But what would happen is there would be the momentum that would lead to the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And that civil rights law would ultimately redefine Jewry in the United States. It's a very important change. And again, it's as hard because if that wasn't part of your own personal experience, then you may find that hard to believe. Many people lived in environments where being Jewish was no big deal, where people didn't bother you. you know, oh yeah, well, you just go to a different church than I do. But, um, but many people suffered tremendous discrimination. I have a friend who, who was uh, applying for a job. She was a very skilled librarian, went to the Morgan Library and they saw her last name and said, sorry, job's filled. You know, so it, it, it kept going on. Anyway, so I recommend the book, uh, History of White People. Thank you, thank you. Um, I think I'm gonna turn this back over to, to Linda. This was a terrific 
a terrific presentation, Justin. I know we're looking forward to part two. And um, thank you so much. Thank you. And I just want to put in this plug here. Marsha is absolutely wonderful. Linda and Marsha have worked very hard to put this whole program together. And they've done a fantastic job. So I just want to say thank you. And we're not saying how much you how much we paid you to say that either. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get my bagel later. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Well, we can find some waitress salad for you. We will <laughs> we'll put some on the bagel. At any rate, uh, Justin, thank you. And thank you everyone this afternoon who has joined us for the first day of our virtual fall conference. And we certainly hope you enjoyed the sessions and the speakers. As I mentioned at the outset, uh, we will be sending out a, uh, an evaluation via SurveyMonkey early next week for the entire program. Uh, please participate because that helps us plan future programs. And for those of you who've asked, when will part two occur? Well, to be announced and um, I'm sure we can bribe Justin again. But let me also thank our other speakers, Naomi Sandweiss, Richard Melzer, and others who were our introducers and moderators. If you're joining us tomorrow, and we hope that you will, uh, we will begin two o'clock Mountain Daylight Time. So if you want to try to come in to the conference, say around a quarter of two, that would be fine. Um, and you should have the Zoom link for tomorrow. It's a separate link than the one from today. Please check. If you can't find it or seem to be missing it, email and let us know and we will try to get you pre-registered again or resend the original link. Um, and again, a special shout out to Marsha Torben and Marsha Reifman for helping put this together. Uh, your technological skills far surpass mine and we couldn't have done this without you. So thank you very much everyone and see you tomorrow.